as I mentioned earlier, my friends, this is going to be the hard part of this, is getting the glue back up in here. I've already got my air uh, hose laying here that I'm going to try to use to blow the glue back in there further. I'm going to try to use the end of this kind of like a syringe and force it back in there a little bit in the crack. I don't know if it's going to work very well, but we'll give it a shot. Pretty sure I'm getting it back in there. I thought I might try this thing too, because you got to remember there's a big piece of steel inside this. So it doesn't have to go all the way across, just mostly on these edges. And actually this is getting it up in there pretty far. So I have a feeling that's going to be fine. But just for safe measure, I'll go ahead and hit it with a little air too. This is really working well as a glue spreader under here. I think that's going to be pretty good. These clamps have a lot of rubber on them. They're very soft, so these work well for this type of application. I don't think these clamps are strong enough for what I want to do. They're good for kind of holding it temporarily, but I think I'm going to get some stronger clamps and put on there. I believe that's going to do me. You can see all the clamps we have on here and uh, that keeps it good and flat. I triple checked my uh, angle here and we still have about 70 thousandths back here which is pretty good. I think it's going to spring back some. I don't think it'll spring back entirely. It'll definitely be better than where it was for sure because it had a real bad underbow and the peg head end of the uh, fretboard was above the plane of this. I think it'll be just about right now. All we can do now is wait and see. Well, it's morning in the shop. I know it may be a different time where you are as you're watching this. But I was going to say good morning America. But, uh, you know, since everybody's watching this, I'll say good morning world. It's the next day. This thing has been sitting up and to be perfectly honest with you, I'm kind of excited. I'm like a kid at Christmas time here hoping that this is going to work as well as I thought it was going to work. Just to explain the science behind what I'm doing here because I know some people are going to question this going you can't do that you have to reset the neck you can't change the neck angle by just pushing the neck down. Okay I didn't change the neck angle I just want to be clear about that. What I saw from my view looking down the top flat like this, if I look from the back down here, this much of the neck angle looked to be right. In other words, it looked to be sloping at the angle it should be sloping. Then there was a huge underbow and the peg head was high. So that's what I was trying to fix. I didn't see any reason to reset the neck because in my view, you know, and again, I can only see this much of it because the rest of it's curved. But in that much, I'm just making a judgment call that the neck angle was correct. So that's why I built this rig to pull that underbow out, glue this fretboard down, and you know, the way that fretboard was on it before, we were below the bridge by almost an eighth of an inch, 120 thousandths. And as I set the neck angle here and pulled the bow out of it, we were above it by about 70 thousandths, at least while it's clamped up. So now we're going to take all this clamp mess off and see what we ended up with, and I have no idea. I'm just hoping that it doesn't spring back too much. If it's perfectly level with this, I'll be perfectly happy. If it's above it by any small amount, I'll be happy. Um, I don't want it to uh, be way above it, of course. 70 thousandths is too high above it, but I figure there'll be spring back. I just hope I allow it enough. I don't want to be below this. That's my goal. If we're below this, then we probably failed. Although we could probably still make it work. 
So let's see here. I'm going to take off the back, the pressure. You can't really see, but I'm taking the pressure off this clamp back here. And that releases all the pressure. Now the guitar is sitting on its own. It's loose. So here's the moment of truth. Did we or did we not fix the problem? And I don't know until I check it. Well, the truth is we're just a hair below it. And that's the truth. So it sprung back more than I was hoping. You know, it's nowhere near as bad as it was. It's, uh, mm, I don't know, 40 thousandths below it, something like that, I'm just guessing. I, I don't know, that's a guess. Let me see what we are at the 12th fret here. That's my best indication. Well, I'm a little disappointed, I'll be perfectly honest, I'm a little disappointed. Well, it's about 30 thousandths at the 12th fret. So that means we're probably almost 60 thousandths below here. So we're improved by at least half. Because we were 120 thousandths below there before. Looking down the top of the guitar, it doesn't look too bad. It's not perfect, but looking down it just by by eye, I would think I should be able to set this up without too much trouble. In fact, it actually looks pretty good. So I'm not sure why it's measuring below, but it, it looks, to, to my eye, it looks fairly good. It's definitely below it though, just a tiny amount, just a tiny amount. Well, we'll just have to go on to the next step and see what it looks like. I just want to make the point on this guitar that, you know, when I look down it like this, it almost looks fine. I mean, it almost looks right. It's, you know, I'm being really picky. It's up just, just the slightest hair. In fact, it's really not up. It's just not down as much as I'd like to see it. It's slightly below level, which is a good thing. Yeah, it's definitely slightly below level. So that's fine. That should work okay. I'm going to level, recrown, polish up the frets, the fretboard, get that all in good shape. The fretboard appears to be absolutely flat. I mean, looking down at it, it looks perfectly flat. When I put the straight edge on it, there seems to be one little bit of a high spot, like right here maybe, but not bad. Very minimal, very minimal. So we should be able to level it out, no problem. Clean all of this up down here first. Then I'm gonna clean up the bridge area because there's some scarring around the bridge and I'm going to try to touch that up. Then I'm gonna set up my intonation rig and we're gonna check the intonation. I see no point in putting this bridge back exactly where it goes if the intonation isn't perfect. We've gone this far, we may as well take the extra time and make sure the intonation is perfect before we glue this bridge down, even if it requires moving it and patching up the finish. So here we go. Just thought I'd show you a close up of the fretboard. I have leveled and recrowned all the frets. They have not been polished yet. I buff them out with sandpaper first and then polish them. I also wanted to just let you look at the before picture of the fretboard and I'll show you an after picture here in just a moment. You know, you can see how rough it is. I'm going to do all the polishing and sanding before I clean up the fretboard itself. The fretboard itself needs a lot of work, so I'm not worried about scuffing it up while I do the polishing and sanding. I know a number of people don't agree with my technique, but again, to me, it's common sense. You go like this. This will clean up the frets a lot. And it really is suitable to stop after this. This is 400. You could do this with 600 and it's even better. But 400 is perfectly fine. And anyway, I just do this and it only takes a couple of minutes. And I mean, like, I didn't even do 10 seconds off screen. This is all, you've seen the whole thing. And I'll just show you an up close of what it looks like after this. And it really does make it look nice. And then we're gonna go ahead and polish them out like a little mirror. 
So this is all in live time here, you see. And now look at the frets closely. There's no marks in the frets. And people say, well, you'll leave lines in it. There's no lines there. You can't even feel anything with your fingernail. With your fingernail, there's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. It's slick as it can be. Or as I like to say, slicker than snot on a doorknob. Now, we'll even make it slicker by polishing it out. Um, you could either use the flits or um, my general preference is the uh, semi-chrome just because it's in paste form. I like the paste form a little better than the liquid form, but that doesn't really make too much difference. They both work really well. And I was looking for it here, and Caleb just rescued me. That's more than I need, really. I wish I wouldn't have got that much on there. I'm going to try to put a little bit back. You only need a tiny amount. And then you just go this way with your fret, like this. And, and, and I'm, again, I'm doing it in real time. And you'll see how quick it cleans them up. All right, so there's the first four in real time. And you can see how shiny they are. They're just almost like a mirror. And so you can't hardly beat that process. This one little fret here, my gauge is I take the deepest spot and I file to the deepest spot. There was a spot right here that was the deepest. You can still see it, and maybe if I'm being truthful, I can barely, barely, barely feel that. But to me, that's where you stop. You don't keep going and going down way below that. You're just wasting all your frets. You can file these frets more times than most people think. You can file them generally two to three times at least. And a lot of people will argue with me and say, you can't do that. But if you recrown them properly, and the way I recrown them, is believe it or not, I take the biggest fret file, the biggest standard fret file, I grind off all these edges along the edges. This recrowns much faster than the smaller files do. And by grinding off this and rounding over these edges, you don't leave any marks, and it recrowns them much, much, much faster than the other way. So, anyway, all I gotta do is polish the rest of these, and then I'll clean up the fretboard. I'm doing a little detail work on this guitar. You know, after taking the fretboard off, there's always little microscopic holes and things, even a, sometimes a groove right there. And so this is kind of the ugly duckling step here. I just take and rub this uh, Timbermate into that crack and it, it does penetrate a little bit. There's almost no penetration because there's almost no crack but there's some and it fills in the little tiny tiny voids and just will make it look better when you're done and then like you can just take your finger rub out most of it like that and I've already done it on the other side and rubbed out most of that so we'll give that you know 30 minutes to dry or so and then we'll come in very lightly just with the maybe some 400 or something and just barely lightly touch that up maybe even with a damp cloth and wipe it off because the the uh, timber mate wipes off really good with water and then we'll just very lightly stain that and you'll won't even be able to tell it at all the fingerboard has been uh cleaned up and polished, but I have not added the wax to it yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and use the Be Good Wax and try that. And just a side note, on these little shop towels, you know, don't throw them away after one use. I use them over and over and over and over. You know, I might use each shop towel five, six, seven times, maybe more than that sometimes. And 
you know, once they get something like the wax buildup on them or whatever and they got enough holes in them, well, then I throw them away. You'd be surprised that, you know, clean up messes, like if you spill something, you can take these dirty shop towels. You know, those spills don't care if you're using a dirty shop towel or using a clean one. So I just recycle them left and right and left and right, and there's almost nothing left of them when I throw them in the trash. Just thought I'd tell you that as a side note. The towels can be expensive. I mean, they do cost money, so you might as well get your money's worth out of them. And uh, then you're putting less in a landfill tool by using, using them more and more without uh, throwing in additional towels. So, this stuff, I'm beginning to kind of think this stuff is growing on me. I, I kind of like this uh, Be Good Wax and Oil. So there's the final fretboard, what it looks like. You know, you can still see a tiny amount of fingernail groove in there. That, again, I kind of do that on purpose. I go down and take it almost all out. Leave maybe the very deepest spot, just barely showing. That way, you know, you're not going way below where you need to be. And there's no point in wearing out your wood and your frets and your fretboards and all that stuff prematurely. That's looking pretty good up here. Now I'm gonna turn my attention to setting this thing up in terms of intonation, getting this bridge glued back on here. I've got the dark brown here now. I took a damp towel there and wiped this down and it was just barely damp and that, that knocked off all the timber mate and everything is smooth here. So now I'm just gonna take this dark brown and on a tiny brush and go through and just touch up the white little line there. And you won't even be able to tell it when I'm done. There you go, you can, you can barely tell it. I mean, keep in mind, this is an old beat up neck and everything. The neck has got a lot of scarring in the back here. And that looks like from capos, different kinds of capos over the years, probably what that's from. But uh, the part that I did here is barely, barely noticeable at all. And you really got to be looking at it to see it now. By the way, another helpful tip for putting this stuff on, because this stuff runs everywhere. I just shake, shake the bottle, get just you know some dampness in the top, really, and that's what I use when I just need to put on light amounts of this stuff, because this stuff runs everywhere. That way you don't get too much of it. And a little bit of this goes a very long way doesn't take much at all. I'm setting, setting up the intonation on this and a lot of people ask about this rig and I think they have misunderstandings or at least based on the questions I hear a lot of misunderstandings. You can see this is just a coat hanger wire and then I put a little spreader in here to keep it spread apart and then I just put bent a couple of hooks on here and I have the uh, strings hooked into those hooks. That's all it is. Nothing complicated. I put leather here to keep from denting the end and leather on top up here to keep from scratching the top. The bridge is floating. The bridge is not glued down at all. It's just laying there and you can move it around. Then up at the other end of course it's just the normal connection. So then I take the tuner and I'm going to set it on top of the guitar, which I don't normally do, but for purposes here where you can see what's going on. You, you note it and you try to get your note as you know centered as you can. And then you note it at the 12th fret and you see if it stays centered, and it does in this case. Okay, so I've got the bridge located pretty well. And so some people are asking me, how do I get the angle in here? How do I know that the angle is right? Well, you know, even on a brand new bridge, when I'm not, 
you know, when I don't even have the slot cut in there, I'll lay a temporary saddle on top, you know, and I set all of this up and I try to get it lined up and everything, and then I mark where the saddle is and then I cut the slot in, in that spot. That's how I do it. In this case, the slot was already cut in this original bridge, and so I am just floating the original bridge around with the original saddle and everything until I get it just right. I believe I've got it just right now. Now, the trick is, um, the bridge is actually this way about whole less than a sixteenth of an inch than where it used to be. Now, you could say, well, that's because of what I did to the neck. And I'd say you were wrong because, if anything, I moved the fretboard back this way, which should make this go that way. So had I not moved the fretboard back that way, which I did a little bit, I didn't realize I did, but by bending this neck down too, that may be part of it, but there's actually a slight, a very small crack in front of this nut now, and that's the original nut. So anyway, the long story short is, what I did to it didn't really change this. This bridge just wasn't in the right place from the beginning, I guarantee you. I mean, it is very close. Whenever I noted, it was flat. And so I had to move it forward, move it forward till I got the note to be the same. That's really on the money. string keeps stretching or something. The big string. That's very close. All right, so everything has moved forward just a tiny amount. So now I'm going to remark this with my X-Acto knife, and then I'm going to clean this all up inside of the marks and refinish outside of the marks. So I'll hold this in place and very lightly score it. Behind it here, I'm really scoring bare wood for the most part, but at least it'll give me a line that I can see. I'm not trying to really cut it, I'm just scratching it more than anything. And in fact, because I'm on bare wood in this case, I think I am going to take my really sharp mechanical pencil here, and I'm just going to lightly put pencil mark on this. Just to, anything to help me see it. I'm going to go ahead and score the ends here. And I'm going to score especially in front because that's going to be new finish. And when you're doing this, you want to make sure that you angle your blade slightly in toward the uh, bridge to keep your point from wandering out into the middle of your guitar top, which would not be an ideal situation. Okay, I believe that's got it. And, you know, I have to take strings off, clean this up as best I can, and I'll try to refinish as much of this as I can before I put the actual bridge on. I've covered this tool many times, but I always get a lot of questions about this also. This is just a piece of scrap aluminum stock that was in a scrap bin. I pulled it out, cut a slot in it this way, and ground off the bottom of it so that I can get down real low angle. And it's just using a regular finger plane blade in here, and I just use this screw as a set screw to tighten it down, and that's all there is to it. The knurl on the end was just on the piece already when I pulled it out of the scrap bin, so it just is what it is. Yeah, you could use a regular chisel. This chisel just works better for me because I like the round bottom. 
I can rock it and I don't dig in with this like you would with a flat bottom chisel. I can be very precise with this. It's just a, a great little tool for precisely cleaning up these areas to put the bridge in. With that score line on there, you can go right along it like this and just peel up the wood right up to that score line. I've got that pretty well cleaned off. Um, this area has got some damage from the heat uh, taking this bridge off. So I'm going to just scratch off the damage a little bit here with this scraper because it's kind of folded up on itself, melted the finish a little bit. So I'm just going to scrape off the melted part. Actually, that's cleaning it up better than I thought it would. I might not have to do too much refinish because that's, that's cleaning it up better than I expected. Now if I take a little piece of sandpaper, let me take a little piece of 400 grit here and I'll just a small piece and try to clean up these areas that got burnt. It's not looking too terribly bad. It improved it some, but I don't know if it's going to be good enough. It's still a little dark. It's not terrible. There's a little bit of scuffed up area right in front of the bridge, but not much. Just going to try to sand that a little bit. That's not looking too bad considering how bad it was. Now, the new holes are going to be just in front of the old holes. I mean, when I say in front, they're, they're covering most of the hole, but I'm cutting a little bit in front of these holes. I don't really think, feel like I'm going to need to fill the holes because I've got most of the holes showing through here. But the hole is going to be cut a little bit more in front Keep in mind, we've got a new bridge plate under there, so the holes will be solid on the inside. I don't think there's any need to really go through and fill these because they're pretty tiny, and I don't think it's going to make that much difference in strength or anything else. So I think I'm going to go ahead and get this cleaned up and glued up. This is going to be scratched up a little bit. I can take this, scratch this off, clean this because there's old glue on this. So I'll do that, get that all cleaned up, get glue on both surfaces, and then we'll get this thing glued in place. I'm going to try sticking this on there with some two-way tape. It's a little hard to get in there and hold everything and get everything in place with all those clamps that I use in there. This is just an extra call to uh, take up some space really all it amounts to. It also helps keep it flat. It does kind of help a little bit. And of course on camera it won't peel off for nothing. That's the way it always works. There it went finally. All right we're gonna put that up inside the guitar just more of a to take up space for the clamp but also to add a little bit of strength there and keeping it flat. Hoping that'll stay in there till I get everything ready to go. I need to take the saddle back out of here. That won't be in the way. And then get the glue on this. Since the location on this one is basically the front edge, that's what I'm lining everything up to. I think we're going to be fine. And we can set this in place. That 
not sure why it's folding me down like it is. I can only assume that it's hitting that brace in there a little bit. Getting quite a bit of glue squeeze out on this uh, under the bridge there, which is always kind of a good sign, kind of lets you know you got it mashed down pretty well. I'm going to see if I can look inside there with a the mirror because something doesn't just feel quite right to me and I can't figure out what's going on. Yeah, it's just the way the braces are in there. I think it's fine. If I would have had a little bit thicker call, it would have been a little bit better, but I just didn't have one that would work real well. It's looking good. We'll do the cleanup now. This guitar, I believe, has a lot of shellac in the finish because the water starts to turn it milky white almost instantly, so you, you have to kind of dry this thing off pretty fast. Some of these finishes have more shellac in them than, than others. The ones that are pure nitrocellulose, they don't do that. They don't turn white. So you want to dry it off as quick as you can when you do this type of work on this type of instrument. It usually comes back with no problem at all anyway, but you just want to get it dried off as quick as you can. I believe that's going to be fine. I don't see any problem with that at all. And we'll have to wait till tomorrow to finish it up. Once again, for you, it's been mere seconds. For me, it's been several days. I am going to go ahead and drill out these holes now. As I mentioned to you, the holes are just slightly offset from the originals, but they're not far off, just a little bit. And of course, I have to drill through that new Paduke bridge plate. That should work just fine. The uh, two-way tape held pretty good on that. It kept pushing against it, but uh, finally it broke loose. So that looks good. Now I'll go in there with a reamer and ream the holes just slightly. This reamer works out perfectly when you just feel it coming through the hole. Right there is just about right. It just doesn't take much. All right, we'll vacuum up that mess and then we'll start seeing what it looks like with strings on it. Just getting started putting the strings on this. I'm gonna use medium phosphor bronze from Diodario, J17s or EJ17s, whichever you prefer to think of them. I'm in the old school and I think of them as just J17s because that's what they were called for years before they went to the environmental packaging. But anyway, you can see how I put that on there. I wrap it around there time and a half and then just go right back over the top of it and it's very quick I'll show you that in slow motion on the next one that way you don't have a lot of string winding you're already up to tension very quickly I then take the cutters and I lay it right across the top of the post and cut the part off flush with the top of the post that way you don't have a bunch of stuff hanging around making noise and sticking people in places they don't want to be stuck and I just poured out all the string pegs here a moment ago, and now I can't find them. Here they are. And in addition, I'm also filing a bevel in the string pegs so that they don't catch on the end button. It's really fairly easy to do. You can see there the bevel that I filed into that right on the end. That way it slides right off that peg really easy. I'll go ahead and zoom in on this a little bit so you can maybe see what I'm doing. You just pull it up tight, you go around this peg one time, that's once, and then half again, and you poke it back through over the top of the strings you just wound. 
It's important that you poke it in over the top of those strings. That makes you wind down the post. And so then you basically you're already tight. Just a couple of turns like that. Very quick. This method works great on the bass strings on this side, or, all, or even all of the wound strings. I don't use that method on the solid uh, strings without the winding. I'll show you my method on those. It's almost the same, but it's not quite as fast, but it's, it's a little more secure. They tend to pull loose easier. Once again, we'll clean this up. I'll show it to you one more time. Just knock that bevel off there real good. Got that string in. Pull it up tight like so. Just pull it up tight on the inside of the post. Go around the post once and then come back around, you know, halfway and poke it through the hole above the other strings. And that time I didn't get above the one string there. That, there you go. Anyway, there you go. It's above them now and I pull it tight, just pull it up tight and then you're almost tight already and just a couple of turns you're tight. So you don't have much use for a string winder doing it this way. Plus it's about the fastest way you can do it. Somehow I'm missing a string here, I think. I don't know how I missed one, but I think I am. Maybe I fell on the floor. I'll find it. It jumped out of the package here and fell on the floor. It only does that on camera. There we go, that looks good. Since this is a wound string, I'll do it the same way. But the other two strings I'll do differently. Now this time, of course, we're going the opposite way around the post because we're on the other side of the peg head. But once around it, back halfway around it, and back above the other two strings. Very simple. Can't do it much simpler than that. It's already tight. Okay, so now on these, what do I do different? You know, I pretty much do this the traditional way. And of course, it, everybody's got their own method, so I don't know, traditional for me may not be traditional for you. Let me clean up an, these last couple of pegs here. This file is a double cut file. It cuts much faster, so I don't have to do many strokes with this to get them down. All right, so on these, I go ahead and do the typical thing. I go through the hole first, and then I pull it up with just a little bit of slack. You can see the slack that I have there, very little. It's almost tight. Then I just go back under my string, you know, around the post on the outside like this, and back under the string, pull the string up tight, and then lift it up like that, and that locks it in place. Now there is some slack you can see in the string here. I'm holding that with my finger as I tighten the peg. Now this one will take a little more tightening, but this keeps it really secure. Now you could do the same thing with these uh, that I did on the other posts, but you should go around it at least, at least two and a half times one and a half times just isn't enough for the solid steel strings. But you could do it. You could easily do it with the same method. But this really locks them in securely. They cannot come out that way. So pull it in there fairly tight, but not quite as tight as the other side. Go back under it. And then lift up and then Put the string back here, hold this tension with your finger, like that, and just tighten it up. And then again, you're winding down the post. You want your winding to go down always. That's very important. 
and this takes a few more turns as you can see but not a, a lot of turns you know because they're basically the same length all the time so there we go we got six strings on there in just a few seconds we'll zoom back out here and start checking everything and see how this thing is working out okay I haven't obviously tuned it since you saw me put the strings on there so the action looks really low right at the moment but now I will tell you I put the original saddle back in here and the saddle is cut very low so, you know I'm gonna start with that and we'll see where we go I can tell already might be too low but I don't think so it's playing real good and seems like it's clear let's just double check where we're at on the action though because it's uh, it's very low no question about that here's the 12th fret and we're at on the base side about 74 thousandths on the base side which is a little lower than I typically set them and on the treble side, it's about 62 or 3 thousandths, so that's really, really low. Now, I did level the frets really well, so hopefully that's good. Let's get it out here and play it just a little bit. I'll check the tuning one more time, and then we'll play it a little bit more for you here. Well, there you have it. Experience does count for something. Uh, you know, I knew that the neck angle was right on the edge. Does it need a neck reset or not? Obviously, if you can get the action down that low, you don't necessarily need a neck reset. In fact, it might be a hair low, and we could raise the saddle up, which would be a good thing, because this saddle is sitting down almost level, and it's not making real good contact with the strings. We can make a bone saddle, antler saddle, and I think that would even sound a little bit better. If I don't raise this up, then I need to cut a little bit of an angle back to the pegs because the strings are coming across the saddle pretty darn flat, and you can see that. So you know, if we would keep this saddle, we need to angle the strings just a little bit toward the pegs. Not a lot, just enough to get some bite there, because there's no bite. But you can see the action is crazy low. You don't see many Martins play that low, but it's playing fine.
99.9% sure that he's going to be very happy with that because he's always complained or he said he's never was happy with the, you know, the way it played. It always had very high action and you can get one with much lower action than that and acoustically and get it to play. Like I said, I, for my personal taste, I would raise this up about 20 thousandths, which would raise this up about 10. That would put this around 80, still lower than normal. That would put this around 75, still lower than what I normally set them up. So by raising this 20 though, that would give you a good string angle break right here, put a lot more pressure on your bridge. So for me, for my money, I think that's what I'm gonna do. But uh, I'm gonna let it set a day like this and come back to it just to test it. You know, when I look down at now, uh, the neck is nearly perfectly flat. There is just the slightest little bit of uh, relief in the neck like it should be. If you remember, this was the worst underbow, not relief, it was the worst underbow I had ever seen in a Martin. It was really a lot, about 46 thousandths. Now I would say it would, you'd be tough to measure 10 thousandths now. You know, I don't know, it's, it can't be much. Yeah, it, it's not much. I don't, I don't know if I can, let's see here, we'll put the cable on it and check it. I'll go ahead and note it right here at the last fret and we'll go right about halfway and it's already raising it at 10, 10 thousandths, right there at 10 thousandths. It's probably no more than 10 thousandths because it's raising it right at 10. So that's really, really good in terms of relief to go from 40 to that. Overall, it's just about as perfect as it can be. It needs a little cleanup yet, but overall, this thing's just about ready to go back to the customer. I'm gonna let it set a day though, just to test that it's uh, everything's strong and it's gonna hold. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the uh, restoration of this old guitar. It'd be hard to get one to play any easier than this. This is set at about 75 to 80 on the bass side and about 65 on the treble side. That's pretty darn low. But yet it doesn't seem to buzz at all. The neck's real good shape. The top's flat now after all the work we've done to it. I'm gonna do an old Gene Watson number called Farewell Party. It goes like this. When my last breath of life
I know you'll be glad when I'm gone. So to play it for you, uh, since I can't flat pick, I'll sing an old Jim Reeves tune. Put your sweet lips a little closer to the phone. Let's pretend we're together all alone. I'll tell the man to turn the jukebox way down low. You can tell your friend they're with you, you'll have to go. You can't say the words I want to hear while you're with another man. If you want me, answer yes or no, and darling, I will understand. little closer to the phone let's pretend we're together all alone I'll tell the man to turn the jukebox way down low and you can tell your friend there Well, my friends, you're in for a treat. Jeff Stark is here to pick up his guitar, and I think he's going to tell you a little bit of history on this old 67 Martin, and maybe a little bit about the uh, autographs that he has on there. Uh, this is uh, uh, 1967 Martin. Um, my dad bought it uh, brand new back in uh, 67 in St. Louis uh, at a place called uh, McMurray Music. Um, and um, just uh, bought it brand new, uh, bought the case uh, at the same time, and uh, just played it and played it. Uh, had bands and uh, just played in a lot of honky tonks and uh, huh. was on the radio. Uh, they did a uh, Saturday night uh, show on uh, Saturday nights. <laughs> uh, my mom played bass fiddle and his brother played fiddle and... Uh, so yeah, this guitar has been around um, a lot, uh, a lot of you know picnics, uh, festivals. Um, sure, just played religiously. So the autographs I did, um, this is um, after um, my dad died in '99, uh, uh, or no, I'm sorry, uh, uh, 80, 89, and. Uh, uh, if you can get a good look here, uh, this one here, this faded one is Vince Gill. Got that one like in the early 90s. He was at a book signing uh, place in St. Louis and uh, bought his book and brought my guitar and he autographed it. But cool. with the uh, strumming, it's kind of wore off. Um, yeah. Later on in the 90s, I went and saw Willie Nelson. Oh, that's Willie Nelson. Yep. Okay. And uh, I believe that's 90, 94, I believe, right. place in St. Louis. I went to one of his shows and uh, autographed it. And then uh, I think about a couple years later, I saw uh, Jerry Reed. Oh, yeah. At the uh, Alton Bell in Illinois. And uh, he really took a liking to the Martin. He uh, strummed it and said it was a good looking guitar. But uh, cool. Uh, but yeah, it was in bad shape, but. Uh, you know, Jerry did his thing and uh, Good. brought her back to life. Great. <laughs> well, I'm glad you like it. I, you know, I, it really does have very low action, and especially for a Martin. You just don't see too many Martins that have that kind of action. And a lot of people will say, you can't set up a Martin that low. Well, you can. They're just like any other guitar. There's nothing, 
you know, magical about them. I mean, they're just like any other guitar. Right. And uh, so it's, it did have so much underbow in that neck. I've never seen a single Martin ever with that much underbow. It, and it really did for some reason. I don't know why. But we were able to fix that too. So everything turned out real good on it. Yeah, it sounds really good. Really good. Got that ring back. It just sounded so dull uh, yeah. before I brought it down. And... Uh, but yeah, it sounds really, really good now. Yep. Well, hope you enjoyed that and getting a little more history on that guitar. Thanks for watching. Yeah.